Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. Uh, it's our first for the academic year. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of, of the Intellectual Forum, and it's great to have you here. And just to let you know, as you'll have seen in the chat, we are recording this event uh, for, for, for people who would like to watch later. Now, normally I'd be welcoming you to our historic buildings at Jesus, some of which you can see uh, behind me, and our state-of-the-art lecture hall, but for obvious reasons, we're doing everything virtually this term. That does mean, on the one hand, that you can join in from the comfort of your own homes, but also means you don't get to sample our homebrewed beer afterwards. And if you care about food miles, you should come and try it, because this beer has moved literally a few metres from where it's brewed to where you drink it. So I do hope you'll be back in person when it is possible to join us for other events. We have a lot of other events coming up this term online. So on Saturday, we have an amazing panel, including the former speechwriter for Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk and others, to talk about how tech is changing the way that we work, think and feel. Then on the 21st, we have Mo Gordat, who used to be Chief Business Officer from SpaceX, talking about happiness and how to find silver linings in a crisis. After that, we'll be talking about whether seeing is believing and what that really means when we do scientific experiments such as looking out at galaxies. And there's much more to come. So look on Eventbrite, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list to keep up with everything that's on offer. But today I'm really pleased to welcome an old friend of ours, Sarah Bridal. Uh, as you'll hear, Sarah started off as a cosmologist, although um, I, I hear a rumor she was a child at some stage before she became a cosmologist, and is a multiple award-winning professor in Manchester. But as you'll hear, she moved away from cosmological imaging to something rather closer to home, how the food that we eat affects the climate and the planet that we live in. And she's done a huge amount of work on this, particularly especially around public engagement, including some utterly fantastic climate food flashcards, which you can find online. I highly recommend them. Um, and most recently released a fantastic and thought provoking book, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air, which I also recommend. It's available for free from Amazon electronically or from all good bookstores in hard copy. And, and frankly, I recommend both. So we're going to hear from Sarah first. And I think there may be a quiz to, keep, to, to check that you're paying attention. And then there'll be lots of time for questions. So please either raise your hand on the participants tab on Zoom or put a question into the chat. And if you want to be anonymous, just send your question to me and I will ask it for you without even admitting who you are. Sarah, it's wonderful to have you with us. Over to you. Mute. That's great. Thank you for unmuting me. Okay, and I'm trying to get myself sharing the right bit of my screen. Struggling to press the right button here. There we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. It's a bit small for me at least. A bit small. Okay, let me press the other button then. Okay, let's try that then. Okay, how's that? Is that a bit bigger? Much better. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see virtually see so many of you on the on the call. And yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how different foods contribute to climate change. As Julian said, um, I've spent the last 20 years doing research um, in cosmology. Um, so more more used to introducing a talk with a picture like this one um, of the beautiful galaxies and uh, and, and I started this research actually in Cambridge um, as, a, as a PhD student in cosmology. Um, but, uh, you know, going back even further, I suppose um, my first thoughts were, you know, what's out there and, and where did we all come from? And, and I went, was very lucky to visit Cambridge um, when I was about 16 and uh, 17, trying to decide what to do um, uh, for university. Uh, a friend of my dad's um, was, uh, uh, at Cambridge and he took us around punting on the river had a glorious day and went back to his rooms overlooking the river and uh, derived equations about uh, the, the, the tides and uh, and the earth and, and gravity and um, I, I really was just absolutely um, couldn't, couldn't wait I really hoped I would get to Cambridge to, to, to experience the life uh, for real so um, looking ahead um, sort of 15 years uh, later, um, I was um, I spent sort of 10 years trying to 
uh, understand the amount of dark matter in the universe um, in a big project. This was uh, led to the largest ever maps of dark matter in the universe. And you can see uh, one of these uh, here. And I, I really started to sort of think, well, what, what, what shall I do for the next 20 years? And I pictured my kids uh, saying to me, uh, what did you do about climate change, mummy? And uh, I thought of myself saying, well, I looked at the stars and uh, it just didn't really seem, seem, seem good enough. And, uh, and part of this was triggered by, um, at about the same time, bumping into David Mackay, who many of you may have, have, have known or come across in Cambridge, um, who had shown me and my dad around Cambridge uh, all those years ago. And um, David had really had a huge impact on my career and, um, a, and a friend as well. And so when I bumped into him in Cambridge um, and he told me he had, um, he had terminal stomach cancer, it was really a, a turning point for me to really think about about life and and you know what we're all doing here and and uh, it was it was a, a huge change for me in, in the way I thought about things and really to to think about the fact that he was no longer doing amazing work as you may have known about his book Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air which really um, was a as a, a guide for for politicians and, and the layperson to understand about um, the energy needs and also the solutions to the energy problems that we face um, to reduce fossil fuels, for example. So um, I started to learn about climate change and. Um, I don't know if you've come across this representation of climate change, but uh, I think it's particularly beautiful. So this shows you in colour the average temperature each year since 1850 to today. And in fact, if you're looking for a relatively uh, sustainable Christmas present, you can also buy the bag. I'm not, I'm not associated with this project, but uh, I have bought the bag. Uh, you can also buy the tie or the leggings, I believe, as well. So uh, lots of options for you there. It might even be a dress, I think. I haven't got that one. But um, anyway, basically, if you're trying to sort of, you know, uh, start somebody uh, chatting about climate change, I find this bag quite helpful to say, do you think it's redder on one side or the other? And I think most people would agree that uh, things seem to be getting warmer as we get uh, to, to the right hand side of this, this diagram. So why is that? Well, um, won't go through all of the contributors to climate change, but just to um, the, the part that I'm going to focus on today is this red part, uh, which is food, which contributes about 25%, about a quarter of all climate change is caused by food. And so that includes the agriculture, uh, the, the clearing the land for the agriculture, the fertilizers um, on the soil, the manure and the burps from animals, packaging and transport, all the way up to, to reaching us, the consumer. And so if we look ahead, um, hopefully we will reduce this green part as we hopefully use less fossil fuels. And in fact, if we stopped burning fossil fuels, food would be the biggest contributor to climate change. And even then, looking ahead, we've got more people eating more food, often eating more greenhouse gas intensive food. So this red part is increasing. And so if we're looking ahead, um, hopefully reducing fossil fuel usage, food is looking to be the big thing for the coming decade in terms of climate change. And uh, if you're looking for more detail on that, you can uh, look at this diagram to your heart's content. This also originated in Cambridge uh, by an amazing uh, PhD student, Bojana Bajelch and uh, Julian Allwood and others in, in engineering. And uh, this was used in the IPCC, the big um, the international uh, committee climate change um, reports. Um, and you can see food here causing about a quarter of all the emissions and the other contributors there. And you can even look at where it's all coming from, what kind of gas and, and how it all works. You can see livestock here, the methane from, from cows um, and other livestock here, for example. Hours of fun. Um, so uh, what do we do about it? Well, um, it turns out the good news is that different foods contribute very different amounts to climate change. So in a way, it would be quite bad if all foods contributed a similar amount to climate change because if we have to eat, so we'd be a bit stuck, but actually it's, it's better than that. So if we look here at this example of an eight ounce steak and uh, maybe some chips to go with that, compared to a microwave potato and beans, um, then I'm not going to do a poll on this, but maybe, you know, which do you think causes the more greenhouse gas emissions and how different do you think it is? 
Um, so when, when people have done research on this and, and looked at uh, public perceptions of climate change impacts of food, often people get things the right way round, but not to the, not, not the scale, the, the size of the difference between different foods. And so I'm um, using average values for Europe. Um, it turns out that um, the steak and chips dinner would cause about 20 times or more than 20 times the greenhouse gas emissions of the microwave potato and beans. And uh, I've just put on here a cup of black coffee and a cardboard cup there for comparison as well. So um, the bottom line is that even having, say, half as much steak, maybe if you can afford it, some better quality steak, can already have a huge impact on your greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to do a poll now. Um, so hopefully Julian can start the, uh, the first poll. And this will maybe hopefully give you some talking points um, for questions, because uh, I, I'm conscious I'm not giving you all of the information here that you probably want to answer this question. But which of these options do you think causes the most climate change? So we've got a bowl of cereal there. Um, we've got um, a latte uh, and we've got two boiled eggs. So this is a deliberately difficult question, this one. So um, let's see how you get on. It is a large latte. I should, I should confess that. Um, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions about the eggs and where they came from as well that we can talk about later. Uh, I can see changing our votes as we go as well. Maybe I'm, I'm giving too many clues here. So uh, <laughs> it's not really a test. It's more for fun and to get, uh, get your thoughts on this topic. I guess we wait for the polling to slow down. I think you probably can't. I think I can see more than you can, right? So I can see that over 75 people have have voted in this so far and I can see that there is a there is a winner at the moment I think we'll have the big reveal uh, when Julian's happy that we've got enough votes in okay so Julian shared the results with you there and uh, so you can see that uh, we've got what's that 60% have gone for the latte and about 20% uh, each for the bowl of cereal and the eggs. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to re reveal now. And um, interesting to think about how different those things are, whether you think they're all roughly the same or, or quite different. So I'm going to press the button for the next slide. So here you can see that 60% of you um, were right there. So um, a typical large latte would contain about 500 millilitres of milk. Whereas a typical um, bowl of cereal, um, according to the packet anyway, would include about 200 mils of milk. And so what you can see there is that um, the amount of milk is really the main uh, thing that makes a difference between the latte and the bowl of cereal. So it really does depend on the size of those two things, which I didn't tell you earlier, which may be a bit unfair. But the details of the cardboard cup uh, in terms of climate change is not a big deal. Of course, many other issues with, with packaging. But in terms of climate change, uh, the cardboard cup, the milk carton are not a big deal. Um, and even heating the milk uh, and the sugar, a uh, very small deal. Even the coffee uh, coming by boat, a very small amount of coffee coming by boat from a long way away is not a huge deal. Um, great. Okay, thank you for joining in with that. I hope that was fun and I hope that's got you thinking of lots of questions. Um, I'm going to leave that for the question and answer later on. Okay, now supposing it's lunchtime uh, and we're going to do another poll now and I'm giving, giving you three options. Uh, one is a chicken sandwich, uh, one is a ham sandwich and one's a peanut butter and jam sandwich. So I should probably fess up that got about 50 grams that's two slices of chicken or two slices of ham same same quantity of ham um, or the peanut butter and jam sandwich so let's see uh, i wonder if you could start that poll julian brilliant okay you're all ready to poll now so which causes the most climate change out of these three options you can see the numbers pouring in there Ah, I've, I see that I've, I've made, a, I've made a, a mistake here. So let's see, I've put, what, did I, what have I got? I can't see what I've got here. Sorry, I've got, I've got the window, in front. sorry, it's cheese sandwich. I'm so sorry, it says cheese on the slide and I've obscured it with my, uh, my Zoom things and I couldn't see it. Uh, sorry about that, yes, quite right, Julian, thank you. Chicken sandwich, cheese sandwich or peanut butter and jam sandwich. 
Great. Okay. Loads of votes pouring in. Excellent. So, yeah, so two slices of cheese is 50 grams, two slices of chicken, 50 grams, or a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Okay, when you're happy, Julian, we can uh, share all of that with everybody. Okay, so uh, let's see, about 30% for chicken, 60% for cheese, and 13% for the um, peanut butter and jam. Okay, so so you guys are not you, you guys you guys know all this already. You don't need me here. You're all pros. Uh, so you didn't fall into the trap that I set for you there. Uh, so some people um, think that chicken is going to be worse than cheese, but they're actually not that different to each other. And uh, so I think these these numbers actually fit quite well with the votes that have come in in terms of the size of those. So, uh, but, so cheese uh, obviously coming from, from cows, um, it takes about 10 kilograms of cheese, uh, milk to produce one kilogram of cheese. So there's a, there's a big um, uh, reduction there. And then we've got chicken, um, which on average in Europe causes less emissions than cheese. You can see it's not quite a factor of two, but it's, it's getting close. Peanut butter, um, even if the peanuts are coming from a long way away, they're coming by boat, we don't air freight peanuts. Um, so that's not really a big deal that it's come from overseas, for example. Great, okay, well, you're all pros. Let's see how you do on the next one then. So um, what about a, let's get this right this time, a small bar of milk chocolate, so 25 grams, a you know, regular small size packet of crisps, um, or a banana? What do you think causes more climate change out of these three options? Okay, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is not close. <laughs> Excellent. Just wait for the last few votes to come in. Okay. So you've gone for the gone for the bar of chocolate. Uh, the biggest uh, result here. We've got seventy five percent of people going for the bar of chocolate, uh, about ten percent for the crisps, and about fourteen percent for the banana. So um, yeah, you're 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 on on good track there. In fact, the difference between these things is relatively small, but. In terms of the question I asked you, then the majority of you are right that the chocolate does cause more emissions. Um, the milk is, a, is, is not actually, you know, it's not massively more than all the other items in this bar of chocolate. So you can see the processing, the sugar and the cocoa um, also contribute, depends a lot on how those um, cocoa trees are, are farmed, uh, whether they've, um, you know, replaced crops or whether they've replaced forest. Um, it's a big range there. Um, and uh, the amount of milk in a bar of chocolate is, is actually more than 25 grams of milk in a 25 gram bar of chocolate, which always confuses, confused me a lot, a lot at first. But of course, we, we put powdered milk into bars of chocolate. And um, so we actually have, there's about um, uh, so nine times as much uh, milk in, in the same weight of powdered milk compared to uh, liquid milk because we've, we've, we've got rid of all the water. But even then, you know, it, all these numbers are on the same scale. So what you can see here is that the snacks that we're looking at here generally cause quite a bit less emissions than the sandwich. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one thing to take away there. Okay, so final poll now. Uh, we're gonna uh, go to dinner, dinner time. So the three options that we're gonna give you now are spaghetti bolognese, chicken curry and rice, or fish and chips. So which do you think causes more climate change out of these three things? And if you, if you think it's too easy, uh, then, then try to put them in order. So which one do you think is, which one do you think comes second? We've not got a poll for that, but you can have a think about it. See if you can guess that correctly as well. Great to see all the votes coming in. 
Now it does really depend on the size of the portion for all of these. So I'm making this very hard for you, um, but hopefully it'll trigger some, some questions that we can all discuss later on. Excellent. Okay, so um, you've gone for the spaghetti bolognese, you've correctly guessed, I think that there's maybe some beef in that spaghetti bolognese. And so what you can see here, first of all, the biggest thing to notice is that this, um, the graphic obscures the, uh, the, the pictures because these stacks here, these graphics are much bigger than the other ones because the impacts of dinner um, are largely bigger than the impacts of the other meals that we've looked at for the, for the specific options that we looked at. Um, you can see there that the, um, if we have about 125 grams, so that's a quarter of a, a regular 500 gram size packet of, of mints, um, that um, that's the largest contributor um, to the spaghetti bolognese. Um, so that means that the simplest way to reduce emissions there would just be to add more vegetables and you know, inevitably then you'll have more portions to put in the freezer for a different day and, and eat um, slightly less mints. That would be um, by far and away the easiest way to approach that at first. Um, hopefully not too many complaints if you had too many uh, more tomatoes and, and onions from the, from, the, from the kids and so on. Um, and actually I made it super difficult because I asked you which would come second and I've, I've actually those two are pretty well balanced those two. So chicken tikka masala and rice um, versus some fish and chips. It depends a lot on the size of the fish and chips, but that's for a sort of um, regular sort of fish and chip shop size fish and chips. But of course, having less fish uh, would be the easiest way again to have a small one instead of a large one. The chicken tikka masala, about half of that's the chicken. There's also some dairy in the sauce there, which, which contributes. And then rice often surprises people, um, but of course, uh, rice is usually farmed um, in paddy fields, which um, uh, I've got decaying organic matter, so decaying um, straw, for example, from the previous crop, decaying underneath the water. And if you have things decaying in water, then they also produce methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, so that's the last poll. I'm going to um, move on to um, the last bits of my talk now. So if you want to look at more of these things, as Julian said, there's a free ebook there with tons of details. Um, of all the, the all those things I just showed you and all, all the detailed information and all the references back to the original literature um, in this book. I just want to mention a few free tools that we've also been working on in our research team um, and our team um, doing outreach called Take a Bite uh, Out of Climate Change, which is a website you can go to, download and play with, with free resources. Our mission is to try to reach the public and tell people about the academic or scientific consensus on how different foods contribute to climate change. So we're not suggesting a particular solution, um, but we're, we're trying to get people to be more aware of these things and to be able to factor in those that information into their decisions about what to eat, along with all the other things um, about ethics of, of human and animal welfare, um, as well as you know price and convenience and taste and all these important things. Um, so one of the things that we've done is this um, game, Climate Food Challenge, um, which is available on our website. And it's a great way to get people started talking about this. If you're trying to introduce um, people who like clicking on, on screens, um, then this is a fun way to do it. Uh, we, do, we do this with kids on iPads at, at public events. Um, we did this at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition last year. Um, and this, uh, this, you have to click on the lowest impact food and then the next lowest and then the next lowest. And it gets harder as you go along and it gives you extra time if you do well. And it, it's a bit addictive, actually. So, um, yeah, that's a warning. Um, you can also, as Julian mentioned, download these uh, flashcards. I've got my, my, my pack here. Um, so you can see these, uh, these flashcards here showing you, for example, for um, how much, uh, say, 100 grams of, of steak there would, would cause in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of uh, the equivalent number of minutes driving a car. Because certainly if I talk to my kids about, uh, you know, number of grams of carbon dioxide, then it doesn't feel very, very meaningful. But if, if you know, they, they, they ask, are we nearly there yet? Uh, so how many minutes is it till we get there? And so um, 100 grams of steak is about 29 minutes or 20, 30 minutes driving a car roughly. Um, but we could look at something uh, like chicken, for example, about six minutes driving a car for the same amount. 
um, or um, you know the, the other things that we already talked about. We've got some some beans cooked at home there um, at one minute driving a car. So a few different options that you could could try out, and they're free to download. They're you know anybody can print them. Anyone can sell them. In fact, um, if you want to start up a, a, a business there, if, if you think there's there's, a, there's an audience for it, um, so we just want to make this available as much as possible. So any thoughts about how to to use this to raise awareness? It'd be really welcome to hear from you. Uh, you can also go to this calculator that we created. Um, currently, it's got all of the meals that and, and foods that are in the book. Um, and so you can scroll down and then add different items here. Uh, a latte with, um, with sugar in a cardboard cup, for example, that we, we talked about earlier. You can see all the different contributions. You can go and edit the quantities to your quantities and then add up all the emissions from, from maybe from your food options if you want to do that. So again, that's free on our website. Um, and we did a we did a fun project. Um, well, the day of lockdown, we were due to have a meeting to decide what to do next. And uh, obviously we had to rethink. And over the, the coming weeks, we had this idea of, of doing a project called Take a Bite Out of Climate Change at Home. Uh, every weekday in June, we put out a new video um, and we made worksheets for kids to do. And um, we had a great time talking to each other on Zoom and putting recordings out. And you can see some, some familiar faces on here. I expect you can see Julian there um, wearing the same hat as he's now wearing at the moment. <laughs> Um, and uh, you can maybe see Ray Randall there that you might know. Um, and uh, so we had a great time doing that. And that's all still on the website if you know anybody that wants to watch lots of videos, including me and Julian talking about uh, food labelling with Ian Boyd um, and others there. So uh, lots of things there, including this worksheet where we got kids to draw their own uh, versions of these stacks that I've been showing you all, all the way through. So we've got kids there drawing um, the emissions from a strawberry that's been coming by ship or coming by air and comparing all those things with, with a banana that, that we talked about before. So that was a lot of fun. And, and for example, getting people to choose which options they want for their lunch and adding up the greenhouse gas emissions from those. You can see my, my, um, my son there being very diligent and <laughs> adding up his emissions from his options. Um, so if you want to know more about those things, then please go to our website uh, or let me know and uh, you can sign up for updates. So fairly infrequent updates, but um, any big things, we'll put it on there. And um, I'm really excited to hear your questions. So thank you so much for this opportunity again and um, looking forward to hearing what you got to want to know. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. That's that's been uh, really wonderful. Um, so just to remind people, you can either ask a question by putting your hand up in the participants tab. There's a should be a raise hand option, a little blue hand um, or put something into the chat. And we've had a couple of questions there, uh, some publicly, uh, some privately. Um, and of course, you're also welcome to put praise for Sarah or anybody else in that as well. Um, uh, just the, the, the first question um, that's come in was about food miles. And I, I have to say, I, I mentioned food miles right at the beginning. But the question was, is it something we, which we should be concerned about? Because you mentioned it only in passing rather than as a major item. Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, Tim Lang, who, who um, coined that phrase, food miles, was actually trying to coin it as sort of a, a, a not really the right thing that anyone should be should be talking about. He was trying to make a point that it was not the important thing, but it's caught on as being the important thing. So I've just gone back to this slide here showing um, for a banana shipped across the world. So for, for a 20,000 kilometre journey, you can see there that the emissions from the transport, so this boat part here on this on this slide is very small, actually it's even smaller than, than producing the banana and um, all the agriculture and packaging and so on. Um, so you can see there that the transport is not at all an issue um, if the food has come by, by boat. Um, but if you send something by plane, then um, it causes about a hundred times more greenhouse gas emissions. So if we were talking about if that banana or if some strawberries, for example, had been, had been flown from that same place, we'd be multiplying that number by 100. So we'd be at uh, 2.6 2, 2, 2,600 kilos, uh, sorry, grams, sorry, 2.6 kilos or 2,600 grams. So we'd be, we'd be uh, talking about a much bigger uh, contribution if it was coming by air. Now that's difficult as a consumer because as a consumer it's very hard to know which things have come by air and which things have come by boat and I would love to see stickers on fruit and veg packets um, which say not not by air maybe an aeroplane crossed out or something or maybe you know, the ones with air, by air with an aeroplane sticker on 
um, because because if you if things come by air, then they it puts them into the similar sort of impact category as things like chicken um, and cheese, some of the lower emissions um, animal products. So the next question is is from Howard Griffiths. Um, Hi, Howard. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh, great to see you again, um, and great to see in your lineup that you had Pete Smith there as well. Um, so okay, so I've got I'm going to quote um, uh, Stephen Fry. Which, uh, which is the, the piece of cod that passeth all understanding. Okay, so tell me, why is cod so expensive in greenhouse gas emissions if it's not farmed? Right, okay, good question. Yeah, so, um, so we've got here that uh, the piece of cod there is, is the, the main contribution for, for, for um, fish that's caught at sea is the diesel uh, for sending the boats out and doing all the processing on the boats and the, the refrigeration and then bringing it back again. So, so I was hoping to find a really good sort of physical explanation of this number, but basically all of the studies that, that look at the emissions of um, caught fish uh, really come down to shipping logs of the amount of diesel that was used on the different ships. And so that's, that's where it comes back to basically. Now, by complete coincidence, actually, the farmed fish comes out about the same, um, but for completely different reasons. Uh, so as you know, you know, farmed fish, you've got to give them food. And it's really very similar then to the chicken calculation because it's actually not that different what we're feeding them. So um, for totally co complete coincidence, it comes out about the same. I don't know what the prospects are for coming up with better fuels or you know, sending ships out less far. I mean, in terms of um, different types of fish, then there have been some studies looking at smaller fish like herring, for example. And my understanding from those papers is that you don't have to send the, 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 um, the boats out so far and cast so deeply to catch the smaller fish. So that is one thing that certainly from the research papers might help. Um, fantastic. Um, so we're getting lots and lots of questions in, which is fantastic. So um, I'm hoping people will, uh, will, will, will say if they'd like to ask themselves. If not, I will uh, pick them up from here. So the first one is, just for those flashcards that were so great, are you going to do a big Top Trump marketing campaign? <laughs> thousands and thousands of them. Well, we we um we have no affiliation with Top Trumps. We 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 just um say so you could play a Top Trumps like game with the flashcards, um. But um, well, we don't we you know we we don't have any plan to do that. Um, it'd be great if someone has um, the money to to set that up. Um, the cards are there and, and anybody can download them and print them and, and sell them. So yeah, that'd be great if anybody's got the capacity to do that. And we're basically a bunch of researchers doing this for fun. So um, you know, that's uh, that's where we are at the moment. So there's, so there's a business opportunity there for somebody here. <laughs> yeah, let us know if you do. We'll put them on the website for you. A couple of questions about um, different types of diet. So, so one was from Garth Wilkinson. Can you compare the average omnivorous, vegetarian and vegan diets? Um, and, and I think related to that, there was a question about branded vegan alternatives that try to mimic meat, um, which presumably need lots of processing, more ingredients, lots of packaging. Um, you know, is a branded vegan chicken nugget as good as a typical vegan meal otherwise? How, how, how would you address those? Great, yeah. So, I mean, I, when I first started this, I was sort of looking to see, you know, what, what should I be eating? And, and really all I could find online was, was, you know, the vegan, vegetarian, omnivore, and the sort of typical emissions for those things. I mean, certainly um, the average vegetarian diet causes about 30% less emissions than an average omnivore diet. An, an average vegan diet is about 50%, so half, half the emissions. There's a big range and it depends on what you include. Um, and different studies come up with different numbers uh, for that within a, in a sort of 10% um, difference. So, you know, there's a, there's a range and obviously it depends on what you're actually eating uh, more than sort of whether you're a strict vegan, for example. Um, so in terms of alternatives, then certainly, um, the, you know, there's, there's not a lot of information on all the different alternatives to know, but um, corn, for example, has been brilliant, um, has put all its uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, information on its website for all its different products. And so what you can see from that is that, yeah, absolutely. So corn is causing significantly less greenhouse gas emissions than equivalent products like chicken and meat for the same weight. 
Um, and it actually varies depending on whether it's frozen corn or sliced corn. So if you want to get into the real details, you can go for the, uh, the frozen corn, which has had uh, less processing and also open fronted chiller cabinets on, on, um, on refrigerators uh, ca ca come into the calculation sometimes. So that's, uh, that's one example. I mean, we've done a calculation just looking at the ingredients of a typical meat, um, uh, meat replacement sausage, for example, and we get numbers which are, so if I just look at my flashcard here, we've got a veggie sausage here causing about uh, equivalent two minutes uh, driving a car compared to six minutes driving a car for a typical pork sausage. So that's a, sort of the calculation that we did. Um, but uh, it'd be great to see those numbers on packets. Obviously, issues with, with salt content and nutrition, um, if those, those, those products are really sort of extracting um, just the, the, the essential sort of, um, uh, you know, just the protein or just the starch and then, and then sticking that together, you lose the, the, the micronutrients, but that's a, a maybe another, another topic. So it's just following up from that, that there's a question that's just come in, which is probably timely. Do, do you have any advice on how to persuade staunch meat eaters on the importance of cutting down, particularly at a time when diets like keto are gaining popularity? Ah, well, I'd love to know the answer to that as well. I mean, <laughs> I think uh, our approach has been to try to engage people in learning a bit about the topic, learning about the numbers. I kind of believe that if we you know, can measure something and if we're aware of, of, of the numbers for something, then that, that can help a little bit. I personally am not really pushing the idea that everybody should change their diet. I think that's really too big an ask actually and what we really and it's also been been demonstrated in, in obesity studies that providing people with more information doesn't necessarily uh, change behavior but the the good news is that providing people with information does change their receptiveness to interventions so if we think about something like the sugar tax for example that's been quite uh, a controversial thing but actually the more that people are aware that this is a, a really important um, intervention then the more receptive people are to those kind of government's uh, you know initiatives so for example you know if we talk about labeling and we want i'd love to see labels on every packet uh, in the supermarket saying the amount of greenhouse gas emissions um, the same sorts of numbers we've got here, but actually updated for each individual food. Um, we'd appreciate a lot more what, what the great things are that are already being done by, by food producers, and including farmers. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one way that we could uh, have a path towards, ultimately, if the information is not enough, um, you know, we may need financial incentives. And it has been suggested that we have a meat tax. Um, so I don't know if that would be terribly popular, um, but, uh, you know, I think it'd be a lot fairer if we could actually do it based on the greenhouse gas emissions, the climate impacts, and um, that would really reward people for doing a whole load of great things. So, yeah, I, I think when I'm talking to people who want to change, but they're not sure where to begin, what I would say is start with quantity. So like I said, with this spaghetti bolognese, you know, adding more vegetables and therefore reducing the amount of, of beef in there is a lot easier than trying to take all the beef out completely um, and, and, you know, try to convince someone to eat a lentil bolognese, which may not be their first choice. So that's where I would begin. And actually, we had a couple of questions I was going to go to next about uh, whether there should be food taxation, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, more generally, what should the incentives be to get governments, uh, what incentives should governments be using to reduce meat consumption and incentives on consumers to, to reward positive things? Now, you've, you've hinted at a few ideas. Um, do you, would you go further on, on a taxation scheme or an incentive scheme? Well, I think we have to see, you know, I think, you know, we should if we've got time, which um, it would be great to start with the informational um, side and then there's a sort of a ladder of, of different sorts of types of intervention that we can do in terms of, you know, um, financial incentives or, or literally removing some of the options, which I'm sure will be extremely controversial. I'd like to see a lot more ed education as well. I think this is so important that, you know, one of our, our sort of passionate topics is getting this information into schools, but also to work with, um, with cater public sector catering, for example, um, I've been talking a lot with TUCO, the, the trade union, university, trade union uh, for university catering organisations, and I know you've done a huge amount of Jesus already on this. Um, so I think that there's a lot we can do um, on, the, on the education side and on the provision side, and that certainly can come from government and, and needs, to, needs to come from government on climate change, probably across education. 
So the, I mean, there's a lot of directions. Great to see so many questions coming in. One question is how we compare climate impact versus other things. So for example, uh, nutrition. Um, so so one, one person bemoaning the fact that we probably shouldn't just live off bars of chocolates, tempting though that may be. Um, and you know, there are other issues like milk is a good source of calcium. Uh, what do you do if you reduce, stop using milk? Um, similarly, that you know, iron in, in, in meat. Um, how do you compare climate impact and nutrition? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and certainly, you know, we we we've got to do this. You know, I think a lot of people, if they if they were to to try to go vegan, they might just cut out the animal products in their diet without thinking about what to replace them with, and that that could, uh, for a lot of people, lead to basically eating a, a, a lot of grains. Uh, you know, basically a wheat-based cereal, some bread for lunch, some pasta for dinner. That's going to be a disaster in terms of nutrition. Um, on the other hand, it's perfectly possible to do this uh, well, but it requires kind of um, a bit more, a bit more thought. So I think that you know, again, this comes to the information. I mean, if we're talking about reducing um, animal products, then we should also talk about increasing the amount of vegetables and pulses. Uh, and nuts so we should really be advertising um, th those things to replace and certainly in terms of the psychology literature um, on this topic then it certainly is not um, very effective to tell people to reduce something it's much better to always talk about what to replace something with or what to add extra so to really focus on that way of, of talking about it um, so then just uh, looking at sort of the meat again, um, so we've had a, some, some more questions about that. So one is how much of meat emissions are from processed foods rather than fresh cooked foods? But if I could also just throw in another couple of, of things uh, related. So what about alternative meat tech? So impossible foods, beyond meats, lab grown meats, um, are they better, worse? Um, and then I guess also in this collection, what about insect protein? <laughs> Where does that score as a, as a stack? Yeah, so I mean, I certainly, um, um, uh, Pete Smith, who uh, Howard Griffiths uh, referred to er earlier, certainly I agree with him on that we don't need to introduce insect protein. We've got plenty of good options um, available to us, which are purely plant-based, um, that would, would, would do the job perfectly well. Uh, at the same time, you know, there is um, there's probably a growing, that the most relevant, um, most, most important use of insects is probably going to be in animal feed. So there is a whole um, set of companies which are converting uh, food waste. So, for example, leftovers from the brewing industry, um, give, feeding that to a black soldier fly larvae and then uh, grinding those up and then feeding them to uh, to animals, uh, chickens, for example. And, and when you think about it, chickens kind of eat insects anyway. If you leave them out there, they don't eat soybeans. So um, it makes a lot of sense to feed that, feed that um, to chicken and fish as well. It's a similar situation with the, the natural diet. So um, I think insects will become incre increasingly important as an animal feed uh, to replace soy, uh, which will be really great. But of course, you have to feed the insects on something. So you have to have a source of, uh, for example, food waste or food byproducts uh, to feed those insects in the first place. So things like lab meat um, offer a bit more potential maybe in that respect, because um, uh, again, you do have to, to feed uh, the, the cultures on something. Um, I mean, it's not in a way that dissimilar to corn in, in some ways of what, you know, what you, you put something into a, into a lab and um, you get some, some protein um, texture, textured protein kind of uh, thing out. Um, but we, we've got a long way to go with that. Um, and of course, at the moment, it takes a huge amount of energy to produce those. But um, as we use renewables and as that technology improves, then it, it could come right down. Uh, I think there was a first thing that you asked about, but I can't remember what it was now. Um, it was about um, uh, uh, processed meat versus freshly cooked meat. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, for most of the animal products, so the things which, you know, the higher emissions products, then the majority of the emissions happen on the farm. Um, so it's to do with the manure management, it's to do with, so about 5% of the calories eaten by a cow burped out as methane. So the actual processing uh, doesn't add a huge amount when you consider that, you know, you've got quite a lot of emissions already from the, the farm side. Um, as to which we tend to eat it, what form we tend to eat it in, we're increasingly eating things in the form of processed meat, but it's not the processing itself which is causing a lot of the emissions. Great. And just... Related to that, because th th there's often a drive uh, for organic, um, and, and your book talks a bit about uh, the, the effect of organic. So, so should we be eating organic? Should we be not eating organic? What's the story? 
Okay. I mean, I'm just really take, bringing a very narrow perspective to this, just focusing on climate change. Um, so in terms of climate change, it, it's kind of swings and roundabouts. So it depends on exactly which product you're looking at. Uh, for animals, it tends to be slightly uh, more emissions from organic because often the animals are living longer, um, which of course is, is, you know, potentially better in terms of animal welfare. Um, but then on the other hand, for other things then, um, you know, for example, for crops, you still have to put fertilizer on. That fertilizer might come from manure, for example, rather than chemical fertilizers, but it's still gonna cause uh, nitrous oxide emissions when it interacts with microbes. Um, increasingly, then there's, there's research and, and more work on using uh, pulses. So uh, beans and peas, which fix nitrogen in their roots, which, which can help. But, but in terms of you know, standard organic agriculture at the moment, then that's, uh, the, you know, it's, it, it's not a huge difference in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but obviously um, you know, things like biodiversity uh, can be very different. Um, so it depends how long term you're interested in the biodiversity, I guess. I would argue that we've got a major biodiversity issue with climate change, so, so you'd have to factor that in too. Um, so there have been other questions about those sort of other factors that, that might come in and, you, you know, that, that it's not as simple as just carbon. Um, you, you know, I guess from a carbon perspective, you know, if you're going to have chicken, you want it, you know, force fed as quickly as possible and killed, uh, which may not be the best for the, for, for the animal. But also, how do you fit in with other environmental damage from specific crops, you know, water intensive crops in arid environments, uh, for example? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's whole other books to be written on those topics, basically. Um, so I've not done that myself. On these cards, for example, we do include the, the water use uh, on there as the blue thing there. So you could, we could just compare, a, I don't know, let's get our vegan, so a veggie sausage there and our, our regular sausage. So we can see the water use there. Um, it's about five times bigger for the regular sausage than the, uh, the veggie sausage uh, in that particular example. Um, it depends obviously on where that water's coming from, if it's rainfall or if it's uh, been specially, you know, drained out of underground aquifers, um, like is, is happening in North Africa, for example, or in, in California. Um, so there's lots of questions about the water scarcity in the region where it came from. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge amount to look into on that as well. And that's, you know, that's also important. I mean, the, the sort of overriding factor that I would, would throw in though is in terms of the efficiency of um, eating animal products. Um, you know, it varies depending on what you're eating. But for example, if you think about something like beef, then a cow has to eat about 50 times as many calories as we actually get from eating um, beef itself. So and there's, there's different efficiency factors for different animals. So it's about a factor of 10 for pigs. So we've got this kind of inefficiency. And so the water use then has to go into growing those crops, which we're going to feed to the animals, um, unless it's rain fed and then it's, uh, it's water, um, water falling on the fields in pasture, for example. But there's still um, you know, a huge amount of um, inputs that have to go in. Um, so generally speaking, very generally, um, then generally speaking, the foods which cause the biggest greenhouse gas emissions tend to also have have bigger environmental impacts but of course that's 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 a very general statement um, and you've, you've talked quite a lot about how food affects climate have you looked at the the inverse problem at, at how cl climate is affecting the production of food around the world yeah so originally when i started writing the book i was hoping to make it about 50 50 you know so partly about how food affects the climate and partly how climate affects food um, and certainly you know it is absolutely you know um, both both of those things are important but it, it turns out that um, there's a, a lot less um, really solid predictions of course on, on how climate change will affect food so there's you know there are studies which look at um, how different crops react to different temperatures so looking back at crop yields at different years uh, then there's you can see correlations between um, the yield and the temperature um, the number of days above 30 degrees, for example, you can see soy uh, yields dropping. So there are calculations about how global warming, the average effect, uh, will affect um, uh, crop yields. Um, and obviously in some places that will go up and some places it will go down. On average, it's expected to go down. But actually, the biggest impact is that the extreme weather, um, in, in my opinion, that's my conclusion. So we could, you know, are we which are we most interested in, the average crop yield for the next 10 years, or are we actually interested in, could there be a year when there's very, very low yields for the entire you know, world? That would be um, you know, <laughs> more of a worry. I mean, in, in biblical times, then people used to you know, maybe store away grain for, for future years when they might not get a good harvest. 
Um, but nowadays, and why don't we do that? Well, actually, it's because we rely on um, globalization. So we rely on trade. That if we get a bad year in one country or one region, we can then bring food, you know, can pay for food to come from other regions. But actually, there's quite interesting um, uh, physics in the sense that um, if we look at the, uh, the weather patterns, um, then to do with the warming of the, the Arctic, for example, then we actually see more coherent weather patterns. And so a couple of years ago, there was some very hot summers, both in the US and in, in Europe. And those were coherent weather patterns that were happening in the northern hemisphere and so the worry is that you could have some extreme weather events which would happen over a period of time uh, which would hit multiple bread baskets as they're called all at once and so that is actually for me a, a bigger worry than the sort of gradual effect of global warming and that's obviously much much harder to predict uh, but could have these kind of you know more more dramatic consequences for humans shall we say now we've talked a lot about about the UK, and you just touched on on globalisation. And f firstly, are the figures that you've given UK specific, or are, could they reasonably be taken anywhere in the world? Yeah, so it, it depends on the product. So for um, something like beef, there's a wide variation depending on where it's coming from. So the numbers I'm showing you are for Europe. Um, the numbers for um, the world average. Uh, would be um, two and a half times bigger, so they wouldn't fit on the uh, the graphics. So that was one reason why I didn't put them on. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, it varies dramatically, and that's largely because um, if the beef comes from a deforested region, uh, so for example South America, then then that would ca cause significantly more um, climate impact from the deforestation. Um, for the the other numbers, um, there's not such huge differences. Uh, but if where there's a big difference between the global average and Europe, I've gone for the European average because that, that tends to be typical for other similar farming systems. And, and while we're on the international perspective, um, there's also issues around food poverty and, and the ethics about the fact that money is spent to grow beans in Kenya or blueberries in Peru. Well, people in those countries don't have access to a good diet uh, and then the profit is taken back out of the country. Um, is, is, is that part of what you've looked at? Uh, no, not really. Um, so, I mean, I think that one of the one of the things that comes out of this is about air freighting uh, fruit and veg, and you know, green beans from, from from Kenya is you know one of the one of the top kind of you know things that's air freighted uh, that we, we we might be aware of that's air freighted. Um, and so, yeah, so so you've got to look at the the farmer livelihoods and those people. What what's going to happen if we're not buying those beans from Kenya? But then, you know, was that ever a good setup in the first place? About you know these kind of effectively cash crops that are being being using up uh, valuable farming land and, and and water resources. So yeah, there's there's a lot of, I guess. I'm calling them short-term issues, but obviously they are massive issues, but I'm trying to sort of focus on the, the long-term issues um, in what I'm thinking about at the moment, I have to confess. So you, you've got in all of these stacks information mostly about the, the, the ingredients and occasionally information about the cooking. Um, is there a best way to cook foods? Um, should we all be raw vegans um, or, or, is it, or is it okay to cook things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we've actually just, well, we're just waiting on doing minor revisions, but we've just had a paper accepted in Nature Food where we, we actually surveyed people um, to look at their, their cooking choices of how they cooked um, uh, a number of key, uh, uh, key things and looked at the way they cooked it, how long they cooked it for. And I mean, it's it's not not rocket science that that cooking stuff in an oven for a long time is gonna gonna cause more greenhouse gas emissions than say microwaving something um so yeah so certainly there's big differences i mean why is the oven bad well the oven we're basically heating up a massive box of metal so it's 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 gen just inefficient from that point of view microwaving something it's rarely going to be the biggest cause of emissions in all of the calculations i actually do think about the cooking so these are meals as eaten um, and so you can see actually there on the spaghetti bolognese thing that we've got the frying we've got some boiling i've uh, got the cans the steel can that the tomatoes are coming in um, and so so it's got those things added on Generally, the cooking doesn't tend to figure, except for, say, a baked potato for one, then cooking, then, then the oven is, the, is by far the biggest impact, even more than the cheese you might put on top of it. Um, uh, whereas if you microwave that, then it, it's way smaller. If you're looking to be super, super, you know, um, you know, mentioned about going raw vegan, uh, I mean, slow cooking is a great way of, of cooking, even though the slow cooker's on for a long time, 
uses very much less electricity you're not heating up a big electric box the temperature differential between the, the slow cooker and the outside world is is smaller so a bit of physics there about about the amount of heat loss and so on pressure cooking um, also tends to be well insulated so um, that's another thing which generally comes out relatively low and um, so we're beginning to run out of questions and beginning to run out of time but there's time for, for a, a couple more if people have urgent things and there's one question about um beef versus other red meat and let, let me slightly change the question is is there a hierarchy of things that we should be most concerned about is there a sort of quick takeaway that these things you should definitely avoid um these things are probably you know much of a muchness uh yeah i mean i would definitely um uh, try not to sort of preach one particular solution. I think it very much depends on each person's diet. Um, but then, you know, if we look at the average UK diet, for example, then animal products tend to cause about half the emissions of the UK diet while not providing, you know, half the protein or the calories. So, so for on average, for most people, reducing the amount of, of animal products and increasing the amount of uh, vegetables and pulses uh, is going to be a, a good thing to do. I'm not advocating um, cutting anything out completely. I don't think that's necessary. Um, I don't think it's a terribly, I personally don't find it a very helpful way to think, but some people do. So, you know, it depends on your personality type, I guess there. Um, air freighted uh, fruit and veg, I find it quite hard to really justify that in my own mind. Um, so I think looking out for perishable things that have, have come from a long way away, things that you couldn't keep in your fridge for a few weeks. So things like berries, uh, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, um, you know, green beans, uh, asparagus, um, things that have come by air. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to justify that, to, to, in my mind at least. Uh, and then, you know, sticking the oven on for, for a couple of hours for one person, unless you really want to heat the room anyway, um, is, is not a great thing. So I could definitely pick those out as the biggest things, but certainly focusing on quantity of, of the highest emissions products, first of all. And, and then somebody's commented about the greenhouse gases from food production, but of course, a lot of food stuff never comes to market. Um, is, is, is that a big factor? Um, like, like I think has talked about how plastic wrapping can actually be quite helpful environmentally uh, for some products. Um, is waste a significant factor with this? Yeah, great. So yeah, so about globally, about one third of food is lost or wasted, which is, you know, very shocking. And if you think about, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions that's caused by that food as it's being produced, uh, then it turns out that, you know, this is this is equivalent to a, you know, a, a reasonably large country, uh, uh, the emission, total emissions for a reasonably large country. So, you know, this is food waste is a big issue. And there's, there's the wasted emissions of producing that food, but there's also, if you send that food to um, to landfill or to a rubbish dump in the, in the regular waste bin, then that food will also rot down in a relatively wet environment and therefore uh, degrade into methane, uh, which per carbon atom anyway is 10 times worse than, than carbon dioxide averaged over a 100 year period. So it's a relatively... Um, bad thing to do to put wasted food into the rubbish bin better to put it into the food waste collection if you've got that in cambridge or onto the, the compost heap so at least that last bit could be saved but still you know the, the overall food waste most people think that this is done the food waste is done by um you know um supermarkets and food producers um according to rap the waste resources action plan in the uk which leads the government work on that 70% um, of food waste in the UK happens at home. So most people don't think they waste food and, and you know, we all try hard, but you don't sort of think, what am I going to waste today? You know, it just happens when you're busy trying to do something else. So um, yeah, it's absolutely a big, big thing. And, and really, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I, you, you've been speaking for an hour now and it's been utterly fantastic. Um, you know, I, I, I've spoken to you many times about this. I had the great pleasure of reading an earlier version of the book over Christmas. And I know you said you shouldn't cut things out, but I haven't had meat since, so it had, had, had some effect uh, on that. Um, and it's just fascinating, such a rich uh, vein of material. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this, Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's learned a lot. So if you haven't had a chance to read the book, I really recommend it. And at zero pounds for the ele electronic version, you really can't ask better than that. Um, but actually the hard copies make wonderful gifts and wonderful things to have at home. Um, and I, I really recommend reading it. The flashcards are wonderful and look out for everything else that Sarah's done. So um, Sarah, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for, for joining us.
Um, I hope you'll join us for other events. As I said, the next event that we have is on Saturday, looking at the effect that tech is having on our lives. So don't miss that one. Sign up. I hope to see you again. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Thank you very much indeed for having me. Wonderful. Great questions.